So we'll give everybody just a few minutes to, to get into the room here. Um, oh, wow, we've got two people already in the house. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, let's see, let me turn my phone down. Happy Friday, happy Friday. Oh, gosh, we see you guys here bright and early. Thank you guys uh, for tuning in. We're going to jump right in uh, this week. So no music, no banner, um, because, we, again, we want to jump in, jump right in this week. Last week, uh, forgive me, had some things going on, so we weren't able to jump on or, or broadcast last week, but we are here this week to continue in our conversation and lesson from our eschatology scholar, Dr. Ed, uh, or also known as Ed Cromarty. Um, and so this is long overdue, if you will, for me. I text Ed and, and tell, told him I'm especially excited about today. I really need today. Um, the Lord has really been tugging on my, my heartstrings, and I'm just coming from a personal uh, position or disposition that the Lord has really been tugging on my heartstrings to not only pray, but I feel another fast, you know, getting ready to come on. Um, it's very necessary for me because my spirit is feeling some kind of way. And I'm sure some of you guys out there in Laberland can relate. Um, so I'm especially interested in hearing about the lesson today. I'm going to be quiet uh, and just listen and take this lesson on today. And where I have questions, of course, I'll chime in. For those of you out there, happy Friday, everybody. Thank you guys for again for tuning in to the Bread Lab Live. Um, I'm your host, Akila C, with our special guest, Edmund Cromarty. We are talking again about the unseen realm. If you guys have questions, please feel free uh, to chime in on the comments box below. Um, I'll be sure to post them on the screen uh, at the most opportune time so Ed can answer your questions. And then again, if you guys missed last the last show of the Unseen Realm uh, from a couple of weeks ago, you can always go back to the Bread Lab Live Facebook page or also go to our YouTube page where you're also able to tune in to all of the other shows in which we've had uh, Dr. Ed as a guest, especially um, with our Are You Listening? The End Times series. It is imperative. It's crucial that you go back and listen to some of that information. But nonetheless, and, and here we are today and ready to jump on in and get ready and dive in. Good morning, Ed. Happy Good morning. Friday. I'm ready for today. Are you ready for today? I know you sent me a text. The body's here, but the mind is is catching up. Are, are we ready now? Yeah, we're ready. Okay. We're ready. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was getting it all together. You know, we have to have our morning uh, coffee and everything. Yes, I'm on tea today. I'm on tea today, ladies and gentlemen. I'm on yeah. tea today. Well, that's so. good. So, yeah, so without further ado, I mean, Ed, what are we talking about today? Because I'm getting some text well, and, and everybody we, wanting to know what we're doing today. We're talking about the unseen realm, and I'm going to reiterate some things. Okay. Let me first start off by saying the basis of this discussion is rooted in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Okay where it tells us we're not at war with other human beings. It may look like that from time to time. But the things that we're actually fighting are spiritual forces that are manipulating people behind the scenes. Um, one of the things that we have to realize is that the less we pay attention, the more that we are glib about spiritual things, mm. the easier it is for us to become victim. We first need to realize that though this seems contrary to everything modern science would like to tell us, it is still very real. And the effects are visible Planet-wide. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about, you know, physical changes like climate change or volcanoes or whatever. I'm talking about how people are reacting, how they are being uh, pulled in one direction or another. We mentioned before that paganism was on the rise. Mm -hmm. So let me get right down to it. Before we begin, 
let's set some foundations. I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to go over it again. We're going to be speaking about two worlds or realms, not physical planets, but something more akin to dimensions, uh, as most people understand the subject. Um, the two worlds are physical, tangible worlds in which you and I live out our lives. And the unseen realm or world is the abode of something else. It is that something else that we're going to try to understand. The okay. answer lies in the beginning at creation. Scripture tells us that God created all that exists. Okay, but just what did he create? Mm -hmm. And what is God? Not who, what? Mm -hmm. We will leave the latter question, the who, for another time. Okay. But understanding this is crucial to understanding the answer to our questions. Scripture tells us that God is spirit. And he tells us that in John chapter 4, verse 24, and 2 Corinthians 3, 17. In 1 Timothy 17, we see an example of detail that most simply skip over as flowery prose. Here, Timothy tells us that God has three more characteristics, and these are important. And this is where, Ed, Timothy? First, this is in um, excuse me, 1 Timothy okay. 1. 17. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> here Timothy tells us that number one, God is eternal. Number two, God is immortal. He doesn't have a time span. And number three, he's invisible. Okay. Now, before we start worrying about, you know, there we go, talking about invisible things. Uh, remember, radar, radio, gravity are all examples of things that are, the air you're breathing are all examples of invisible things. So being invisible doesn't invalidate it. Genesis 1, 1, chapter 1, verse 1, tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know that place where we live? Specifically, God spoke, and not a thing, not a blessed thing, became everything. He spoke the entire universe into being. But let's observe something. God exists outside of the universe, and he is independent of it. I like to say, think of it this way. God created a ball, which he's holding in his hands. That ball is the universe. You got it. Yes, but let's observe something. Just so God, you know, I've, I've been listening, Ed. Okay. <laughs> but let's observe something. God, a spirit, created other spirits. Hebrews Chapter 1, verse 7, gives us some important details. In speaking of angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. We're going to talk about this a little bit more today. Okay. But, but remember, his servants, his angels are spirits and they are flames of fire. Okay, now we're, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of this in a second, but I want to lay that as a key reference. This latter is important because it explains the jinn mentioned in the Islamic faith, beings of fire and smoke. 
before you pick on a faith and, and accept it or reject it, you need to know something about it and the history of it. We don't normally think of beings of fire and smoke, but in Islam, they speak of the jinn from which we get the term genie. Mm. You know, the magical genie in the lamp. That yes. Out. We, we are oversimplifying in our stories a much more complex subject. But there are beings, according to scripture, spirits of fire and flame. God also created or spoke into being energy and matter. The matter coalesced from the initial release of energy and formed the gases and eventually the stars, planets, asteroids, etc. That had some important consequences. Now, for those of you who are physicists out there, if you just remember your basic physics, time as we know it is an artifact of matter and motion. Before there was matter, there was no time. You can't have, if, if there's no matter, you have no concept of distance, gravity, or position. And gravity is related to time. So before there was matter, there was no time. Modern science refers to the event that created this as the Big Bang some 13.7 billion years ago. Science doesn't argue whether it happened. They argue why and how. And is there more than one? Or is this the only creation? I'm not going to get into that right now. In short, God, a spirit, released some energy and created matter and other spirit beings. Okay? So this is basically where we're, we're going to pick up today. And we, we've talked about this a little bit more when we, when we were introducing the concept of demons. Right. All of this is interrelated. But right now I want to focus on the angelic forces because we're going to see some things mentioned about the angels that we need to pay some close attention to. Oh, be quiet. Somebody's sending me a message. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> there are a collection of angelic forces mentioned in the um, book um, hang on one second. Let me see if I can find all this. No problem. Mentioned in the book of Enoch. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Ed. No, I was just saying, mentioned in the book of Enoch, we have a lot of information. And what I wanted to do, here it is. I'm trying to read that light. Sorry, y'all. I'm wondering where this light is coming from. Okay. Where is we that? We need to get an understanding of what angels are as related to us in the scripture. First, remember that much of prophecy is given in Hebrew symbolism. And, and why is this? Understand that the visions are what a man of that time frame is trying to describe. I want you to stop and think about something. You and I take for granted modern technology almost without thinking about it. It's just assumed that modern science can invent in almost anything. But most of you are not aware that 14 years ago, we didn't have cell phones as we know them today. 
the iPhone was introduced in 2007. Mm -hmm. There were mobile phones and cell phones before the iPhone, but they were what we would call crude instruments. I have several of them here. Um, but what I'm getting at is this. If you go back to the time when most of us were born or slightly before, or let's say World War II, the concept of personal communication on a planetary scale was a pipe dream. And if you go back to the time of your grandparents and you tell them that you could talk to somebody on the other side of the country and get an answer back, you would legitimately be accused of witchcraft. I'm making a point for a reason. We assume certain things because of the time frame in which we live and the compounding of knowledge that has come about. One of the indicators of the last days is a vast increase in knowledge. Hmm. Okay. For, uh, is that for the believer, Ed, or for that's who? a general marker? Okay. In times. Okay. That there would be a vast increase in knowledge. Mm -hmm. Our knowledge began to skyrocket with the invention of the internet. Yeah. Because the the as I and I mentioned this before. Right. When the internet was created, there was an effect on the world that most people weren't aware of unless you were a Bible student. Way back at the Tower of Babel, God had a discussion with his angels, the ones on his side. And he said, because man can communicate freely, anything he can think of, he's liable to do. So let us go down and confound their language. And because they could not understand one another, except in small groups, it was called Babel, the place of confusion. What the internet did was reverse that. And ever since World War II, there's been a desire to share information and to learn. We began to grow in our understanding in the 1940s. And it, it went along at a snail's pace faster than prior to that considerably. Mm -hmm. But by today's standards, a, a freezing snail's pace. Then in 1972, a collection of uh, technical giants, I remember it like it was yesterday, invented a term, a concept called the Ethernet. Xerox had proposed a theory. <laughs> DEC supplied the hardware and Bell Labs did the research into the um, hardware and software. Mm -hmm. And a few other companies supplied the additional resulting hardware. And what came out of this was a thing called the Ethernet. Ethernet was originally designed by uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Association. It was to be <clears throat> a survivable form of communication with automatic electronic rerouting of messages that could survive a nuclear attack. Hmm. Prior to that, if you made a long distance call, you had to talk operator to operator. Right. They would find a circuit and hook you up, and that could take minutes. Right, right. If you're, if 
if one of the cities that you were communicating through got hit with a nuke, your communication <laughs> were over. Right. And and trying to find rerouting was well, first of all, it was darn near impossible if you could find a circuit. We didn't have near enough circuits. Mm -hmm. And we certainly didn't have a way to automatically switch. Oh. That was the first thing that happened in 72, is a technology was created. And a concept was implemented on how to switch messages without humans involved. And remember, this is before the electronic switching system, better known to you as touch tone or push button telephones. All this happened before that. You were still using dial phones. Shortly after that, in 1989, a gentleman by the name of Sir Flanders Petrie wanted to figure out a way to share information openly between researchers, scientists, and just basically students of any kind. And he created a technology called the World Wide Web. He built it on one of Steve Jobs' computers. A lot of this information, and this is before the Macintosh, and all of that took a, a hold on the general world. But remember, the Mac was created in 84. The Lisa back in 76. And in 89, we introduced the World Wide Web. For most people, the World Wide Web had to wait until 1995, when Windows introduced Windows 95, that was the first generally accessible uh, technology that would allow us as average consumers to get on the internet. And everybody was rushing to buy modems and dial up and whatever. And we were dealing with what we would call unacceptably, ridiculously slow speeds back then. Now, now, I want you to think about this. Even in the early days of vast, fast computers, a connection that ran at 300 bits per second, what we'd call 300 baud, was considered fast. Because prior to that, we ran at teletype speeds, 110 or 75. Now, I, I point out, when we were doing uh, teletype and Twix worldwide in World War II time frame. We were sending information at 110 bits per second, and that was considered fast. Most folks were sending it at 75 bits per second. That's approximately one character a second. If you've got a page and a half of text to send at that speed, a single page and a half could take you an hour. And that's if it wasn't interrupted by static or radio interference or whatever. And we take a lot for granted right now. Right, right. The speed that we communicate now is not measured in bits per second or thousands of bits per second, or in some cases, millions of bits per second, we are now talking about billions of bits per second mm. that we can transfer back and forth between each other with one of these things. And we do so in a way that began to reverse the effects of the Tower of Babel's Babel. For the first time, we're talking about since 1989, man began to interchange information 
by the time we get to today, information outside of government restrictions freely flows planet-wide at speeds that are unbelievable, like this very program. One of the things I predicted way back in 1969, I told some friends who didn't believe it. I said, one of these days and fairly soon, your telephone, your television, and your radio and other things are going to be replaced by digital communication. Mm. And they laughed at me. And I said, just to sit back and watch. I know a few things about the technology. I know where we're going. And you, you aren't there yet. And the guys I were, were talking to were still building systems using vacuum tubes. Hmm. I was working there because I was one of the few guys that understood transistors and solid state technology. This is back in 69. And I, I remember talking to a guy about how simple and easy to use transistors were. They don't get hot and they don't wear out. And, and he just said, I can't wrap my mind amount around. That. Right. <laughs> he learned electronics in the 40s. We're almost to the 70s, mm-hmm. 30 years later. And in that 30 years, this new technology came about, and he was literally afraid of it because he knew that the job he was doing was based on something that was going to be replaced. Now, let me ask you something. Uh oh. You must remember old style televisions with picture tubes. Yes. You couldn't give one of those away today. <laughs> Not even if you put it on the curve, right? That's somebody yeah. can pick that bad boy up. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe a homeless person might want it if there was no other alternative. <laughs> right. You know, for him to get right. But my point is this. We assume flat screens today. Flat screens were the work of science fiction since the beginning of science fiction. Okay. And I'm talking about going back several hundred years. Yeah. And now we talk about, Hmm. we we carry around flat screens and high resolution cameras that do video, not just snapshots. Right. Right. These were things that prior to 2007, Mm -hmm. unheard of. Mm-hmm. In the hands mm-hmm. of a common person. Nowadays, we're talking about being able to carry in two fingers. I mean, here I go. I'm holding this thing with two little fingers. Yeah. Yeah. More compute power than the entire nation had. Yep. Back in the 50s. We've wow. got watches like this little bad boy right here. This is a 64-bit, not 32, not 16, not 8, 64-bit supercomputer with graphics, sound, and telecommunication. Why is this important to what we're talking about? Well, back when I was growing up, there was a cartoon strip called Dick Tracy. Mm -hmm. Way Radio, it was fiction. I'm wearing one. Most of you are too. Okay, so what what are we talking about? What's this got to do with the subject? It means you and I take for granted technological advances that were unheard of. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just sent William Shatner into space at 90. Right. He never thought. He would ever get the chance to, to, to go to space. Right. Let alone the stars. And now, all of a sudden, outside of NASA or the government, he hops a ride on a spaceship that the head of Amazon built. And he went into space. Quite, quite an a, a achievement. But again, back in 1965, 
Star Trek introduced some concepts hmm. that most of us, you know, we, we were into television and TV shows and we thought it was neat. Are you aware that the concept of the cell phone and the tablet were created on Star Trek long before the hardware existed? Wow. And we introduced what they could be used for. We've gone well beyond that now. Right, 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 and right. We do things with, with our cell phones and our watches today. Uh, for those of you that might be aware, let me just tell the others. You can do medical analysis on yourself with your watch. Something unheard of just 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Not 20, 10. This watch can take my blood pressure, my pulse rate, and several other things. Just And it's just a standard Apple watch. There's others like it all around the world. We don't see that as something unique or special. But try telling your grandparents about it. And that's only, you know, 50, 60, 100 years ago. Mm. Now go back to the 1600s in this country to a place in Massachusetts called Salem and just bring up the subject and see what happens. You'd be burned at the stake for witchcraft mm -hmm. here in America in the 1600s. Because such things are not possible. Right. I'm making this, I'm, I'm dragging this out and droning it for a reason. Right. When you talk about giving revelation to prophets and, and the apostles 2,000, 3,000 years ago, and you're showing them things that are going to be occurring in the near now time frame, some of which are still yet future. You got a problem, a very big problem. Mm -hmm. How do you explain to this amoeba walking around on, on four legs, on two legs? How do you explain to this dumb amoeba space flight? landing on the moon, cell phones. The bottom line is you can't. You stand on top of thousands of years of proven scientific research, education, literature, music, that all of it comes together. You can't just say, well, it's all science. No. Literature, culture, music, all play key parts. Without literature, you wouldn't have any science, period. So don't toss things without understanding. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at the Bible or the book of Enoch or other prophetic works, you have to keep the time frame of the observer in mind. So that when they are describing things, they're trying to tell you the truth in the best way they can. But how are you going to explain a cell phone to a man who doesn't know what electricity is? Remember Benjamin Franklin? Michael Faraday and a few others in the 16 and 1700s? That was when they began to understand. Hmm. 16 and 1700 AD. How are you going to explain all this to somebody that's 800 years before Christ is born or earlier? The book of Enoch was given to man at the time of Enoch, we're talking about before the flood. 
Man wasn't stupid. There was a lot of knowledge imparted to Adam and his sons. Some of that knowledge we're just now rediscovering, especially in the area of genetics. Mm -hmm. An understanding of genetics we're now finding out was relatively common knowledge back then. We had to wait till Mendelssohn again in the 15 to 1700 time frame, a period we call the Renaissance. Yeah, that's a French word for you, Akila. <laughs> but uh, we had to wait till the Renaissance before a lot of this stuff started to be recategorized and understood. You know, one of the things I, I'm amazed is how many so-called scientific scholars know so little about history. Let me give you a good example. If you ask the average scientifically educated person who invented the steam engine, everybody will run and tell you about James Watt and how he built this steam engine that was used to power boats and other things. And I'm not taking anything from him. Uh -huh. Most of them don't know anything about Hero. Way back in Egyptian times, who invented a steam engine to power the cranes that lifted cargo from the ships in Alexandria, Egypt, 3,000 years ago. We like to think that Union Carbide and other countries, uh, companies, excuse me, um, gave us batteries. We have real trouble with the discovery that batteries, electrical batteries, were well known to the Babylonians. They were part of what they used to light the gardens, the hanging gardens one of the seven wonders of the world, at night. We only really recently rediscovered these. Huh. Oh, by the way, one of the batteries they dug up still works. Union, Union Carbide has an open deal. For anybody who wants to get rich instantly, tell them how to make that kind of a battery. They'll sell you batteries, Duracell and Everett and others that might last 10 years. Huh. But a battery that lasts 3,000 years and still works? Right. Uh, we ain't figured that one out yet. But we know right. there is one that you can go look at. Just pop over to the Smithsonian. They got one they can show you. Still works. So don't be so quick to toss out the fact that things are known to some folks thousands of years ago. And how did they get that knowledge? This is part of what we're going to be talking about. Okay. It goes, again, it goes back to angelic beings. Now, in Psalms 8, verse 5, and Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7, there's a reference to the creation of man. In general, man was created. We were created to worship God. And we were created after. Listen to me carefully. We were created after there was a revolt in heaven led by Lucifer. God said, okay, you guys want to go start your own universe? Go right ahead. And something happened they weren't expecting. God says, I'm going to make some replacements. And he created man. In particular, the scripture says, that he created man 
and he was made a little lower than the angels. The story refers in general to man, but in Christ in particular, because only Jesus incarnate in the flesh was crowned with glory and honor. It's not a term that refers to man in general. We're referred to as sinners. The only sinless man was Christ Jesus. But it says man was made, including Jesus incarnate, mm -hmm. lower than the angels. What does this mean? They were created lower than the angels. Again, remember symbolism. It means that man was created mortal. As mortal beings, we have a time frame and a time limit. We were born to, into a particular time. We're going to live on the average about 70 years. And then our time is up. Some of us are going to go a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Some of us are going to go a little bit less. Mm -hmm. And ethnicity and diet and family history and a whole bunch of other things play into how long you're going to be here, including do you live in a city where there's a lot of rampant gunfire going on? But all of these things speak to the fact that we're mortal. And sooner or later, we're going to exit out of here and go somewhere. But we're only one creation. We were created to worship God. But we're mortal. Our spirits are encased in flesh. And in this encasement of flesh, we have our being and exist in time. But the, the encasement is not who we are. Inside, we are spiritual. You know, I like to use a reference to lighten things up a little bit. To Star Wars, there's a certain character called Yoda that if you listen carefully to what he's saying, makes a lot of sense. At one time, he tells Luke Skywalker, we're not this crude flesh and blood. Luminous beings are we. Where, where did that concept come from? Mm -hmm. You have to go all the way back to Genesis in the first few chapters. When man was created, he had two parts to his nature, the fleshly and the spiritual. And the spiritual was luminous. It, we literally glowed in the dark. It's one of the reasons Adam wasn't afraid to be walking around on the earth. When the sun went down, a, he was luminous. B, God came and lit the place up. Right, right. But when man sinned, the light went out. Which is why Adam sought to cover himself. Not that he was naked in the sense that we think of in the flesh. I mean, God created every animal on this planet without clothes. Think about that for a minute, right. including right. human beings. Right. There ain't nothing about you that God don't already know. He invented it. <laughs> right. Inside, outside, private parts, public parts. Right. <laughs> God made all of it, knows all about it. Right. It's not a surprise to him, including what you might do with it. Hmm. But. What we tend to forget is that's only the fleshly part of the container. 
when Adam sinned, he had been warned by God that in the day that you sin, you shall surely die. Day with the Lord is a thousand years. Nobody made it to a thousand. Methuselah was the longest living. He lived 969 and dropped dead. Adam, from the time he sinned, lived an additional 930 years and died. But let me point something out that is not well understood in the church. Adam was not 930 years old when he died. He lived an additional 930 years from the time he sinned. He was a whole lot older than that. Mm -hmm. Because he walked and talked with God for eons. I said eons before he sinned. Oh, by the way, before Eve was created. Eve and Adam did not enter this world at the same time. Right. Scripture bears this up. And unless we get this, this little fact of differentiation through our thick skulls, I think we, we know better than God that we're all equal. First of all, let me explain something on that subject right now. God did not create everybody to be equal. Not even the angels. They're not all the same. Read your scripture. We're going to get into that in a minute. Right, right, right. But some are great, some are small. With man, he made some great, some small some rich, some poor. I'm talking about before the sin. They're not all the same. He created animals, all different. He created plants, all different. I want you to think about this. No two snowflakes are the same. Since the beginning of snowflakes, you can't find two that are identical. And and that's mind boggling if you stop and think about it. I, I am. I'm I'm how many millions yeah. of years of snow has been falling and no two are the same. And somebody's gonna rush out there and say that that can't possibly be true. I challenge you to find two yeah, that are right. identical. This concept of duplication. Mm -hmm is man's idea. Yes, yes. Okay, a, a particular man symbolized by the number six. And I'm speaking of Lucifer. Well, let me go on. Man was created mortals, but of the angels, they're not mortal. Are you there, Ed? Uh-oh. It was just getting juicy, y'all. Ed, are you there? Did I lose you? Give him just a moment, y'all, to hopefully sign back in if something happened. Satan, we rebuke you. <laughs> Thank you guys uh, for tuning in. You guys are tuning into the Bread Lab Live with our special guest and eschatology scholar, Ed Cromarty. We're talking about the unseen realm. Um, jumping back into the conversation or the lesson that we had two weeks ago with the Unseen Realm Part 1. Um, we're coming back today to continue with the conversation. Ed's going to, I'm sure, jump back in, give him just a second uh, to come back on. But I mean, it was just getting juicy, y'all. So hold on. Let's find out where he is, where he went. It was getting good. I know. Stay, stay on. He's coming. Um, right there he is. So give us just a second. It was getting good. I'm gonna tell him everybody said this too. Hold on, Ed. There you are. I mean, we were just all getting into it. The popcorn. I'm missing my popcorn and everything. We got comments coming in. Everybody saying it was getting good. Good morning, Lila on Facebook. So yeah, we're 
We're ready. Are you there? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Okay. So you said yeah, that yeah. angels are not mortals. Angels are not mortals. Now, now folks, let, let me just, while, we're, while this happened, let me just say something. If you think what just happened hmm. was a mechanical accident. It was not. Green. Yeah, it was not. The angels were created as immortal spirit beings. They exist for one purpose, to serve God who created them. I mean, stop and think about it for a minute. If you're working on a farm and you go out and buy a tractor or make one, let's go back a few years, you, you go out and make a tractor, you expect it to do things for you or for someone like you. You don't just create it to sit there on the shelf unless you're into static art. But if you make something that does work and, and does things, you expect it to perform the functions for which you created it. Thus, the angels. Mm. Now, there's a hierarchy of angels. And we need to understand some terms and be clear on them. The term cherub in the Hebrew is singular. The plural form is cherubim. So don't okay. say cherubs and cherubims. Those are mispronunciations of the term. Cherub for singular. Okay. Cherubim for plural. The same term applies to seraphs. A seraph is singular. Seraphim is plural. So when you read in the scripture, you'll hear the term seraph or seraphim, cherub or cherubim, singular and plural. The term archangel simply means a chief or first created angel. God created millions of angels. But he started at a particular place. The archangels were created first, and they are the most powerful. The book of Enoch tells us that there are now seven archangels. There used to be eight. The seven that are listed are Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel. Let me start over again. Okay. The seven archangels are Micah L. Look at how I'm pronouncing it. Micah L. Raphael. Gabriel. Uriel. Sarah Quell. Ra. Raguel and Rimael, all of them had in their names the syllable L, which means God or of God. This is not an accident. So, you know what, Ed, I, I also heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I also heard the law the L-A-H or the L-A also meant the same. Is that accurate? Uh, not quite. Okay. And, and I'll get into that at another we'll Talk time. about that offline. Yeah. Okay. 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 But the most powerful of the angels are the seraphim. They're referred to in scripture as the fiery ones. Islam says they're known as the jinn, D-J-I-N-N. -N. Don't close off knowledge just because it's not your particular brand. 
You need to learn from all sources. Filter out what's true and what's not true and separate them. But the fiery ones, the Islam calls the jinn, we call the seraphim. They're the ones closest to God. Seraphim are a peculiar form of cherubim. The cherubim, or as some of us would say, the cherubs, mm -hmm. are the most powerful form of angels. But the seraphim are the leaders. They're the top ones. They are the archangels. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 through 19, tells us that Lucifer was at one time the anointed cherub who covers. Covers what? He was the one who covered or guarded God's throne mm -hmm. uh, by himself. He didn't need no help from nobody else. And he also led the worship services in heaven. Scripture says his pipes and tabrets were created in him from the beginning. He was a, a walking musical instrument. He didn't need instruments. He was one. It also pointed out in the same area, Ezekiel 28, that Lucifer walked among the fiery stones. When it says he walked among, think of he hung out with mm -hmm. the fiery stones. The fiery stones are the fiery ones, the seraphim. Lucifer hung out with the seraphim. He was one. Before he lost his office, he was the chief of them. Now, let me say that again. Of the seven that are left, he was number one. He, he made the eighth. He's not there anymore. He was cast down from his office and banished from being in the presence on a daily basis, as we would say it, of the seven archangels. But as Job points out, God holds counsels in heavens from time to time hmm. where he calls his angels, come, let us talk. And the first ones to show up at the discussion are the seven. Job points out that the eighth also shows up. And God talks to you. God doesn't say, what are you doing here? He said, where did you come from? I came from to and fro in the earth. Seeing what mischief I could start. And God holds a discussion with him. Read it in the book of Job. Read it with a sense of understanding. That what is being said is real. Job and God are having a talk. I'm sorry, uh, Lucifer and God are having a talk in the book of Job. He walks in and greets the other angels who don't want him there. But every single one of them, including Michael, who's now the lead archangel, has to remember that Lucifer held the position and they will respect the position even though they detest the being. And God warned him when the incident over the death of Moses where Lucifer and Michael fought over the body of, they were physically in combat hmm. over the body of Moses. 
And Michael wanted to cuss him out. <laughs> but he remembered that he had to be very careful in what he did and what he said. So he said, the Lord rebuke you. Hmm. Now there's going to come a time when the Lord's going to cut Michael loose and say, go, you know, all that stuff you've been holding back, go have at it. Right. But wow. that's the future. Mm -hmm. Right now, Michael has to be very careful. It's not the man. It's the position. It's like, th think of it this way. It's like the, the White House. The occupant of the White House, the president, regardless of what you think of the man, right, is the occupant of an office. And by military force, if necessary, you will respect the occupant of the office. Mm -hmm. If you don't like him, vote him out. Don't try any other way. We got guns, bullets, and bombs to stop you. Huh. You will respect the office, regardless of who holds it. This is a lesson that Christians need to learn. The best example I can think of is take a look at who's in the White House right now. Or his predecessor. I'm not picking parties. I'm saying whether you like the man or not, the Secret Service and the entire United States military will back up the office of the president. God will back up the office of the archangels. And anybody who thinks otherwise is in for some serious trouble. Right. Now, we mentioned that these creatures were extremely powerful. And prior to the flood, they had the ability to travel throughout all of creation. In fact, in one place in the scripture, it, <clears throat> it describes... It describes cherub, cherubim as creatures covered with eyes. Now, again, this is symbology. But they appeared to the observer, a mortal man, to be covered with eyes. And in a flash, they could be sent forth, view all of creation, and come back. You said in a say that one repeat that one more time, Ed. You in know? a flash, uh -huh. these cherub cherubim could be sent forth to observe all of creation. Okay, come back and give a report to God. That's their job. In a flash. In a flash. Now li listen to me carefully. Remember, they exist outside of creation. They are not limited to the physical universe. They exist in heaven with God outside of the mortal created universe. Time means nothing to them. They're eternal beings. But because they are spirit and not subject to the laws of matter and energy, their ability to be in multiple places at the same time is not limited. They can go everywhere and report back to God. Don't try to figure it out yet. Our science hasn't fully understood that. But if you ask modern physicists about certain particles they have recently discovered, I'm talking about in the last 10 or 20 years. They'll tell you about certain subatomic particles that can be in two or more places at the same time. 
Mm. This isn't supposed to be possible, but it exists. Mm -hmm. It exists as a physical, observable reality. It requires a lot of specialized equipment and highly trained physicists to observe it. But they have, and it does exist. In fact, one, one physicist called the thing the God particle. Because it can do something that's not supposed to be possible. It can be in two places at the same time, vastly separated in distance. Okay. You know, we used to talk about how God can hear our thoughts wherever we are in the universe. And he can send forth his angels and they can appear. And they're not, I'm sorry, ancient astronauts, they don't need spaceships to get there. They just appear. They're spirit. And spirit can take on the form of mortals when necessary. Mm. Is that why the Bible says you, you never know when you're entertaining an angel? That's right. A ask Abram. He entertained three of them. But he was smart enough to discern from their behavior patterns. These weren't mortal men. And yet he prepared food for them. And he wasn't sure they were angels until he served the food. And instead of eating it, they consumed it in fire. It was at that point that Abram knew. He was face to face with angels. One of his descendants, a certain gentleman by the name of Jacob, Jacob actually got into a wrestling match, physical oh. contact with an angel who was there representing God. And the scripture mentions something that everybody just overlooks. They wrestled all night long. Oh. <laughs> but as the sun began to come up, The angel said, let go of me. Why is this important? Go back to the time when Adam walked and talked with God. The scripture makes clear that once the sun went down, God himself appeared to Adam. And he stayed with Adam until the sun began to come up. There's a pattern here. God's not afraid of the sun, but he and his angels observe certain laws. He established them. The spirit makes its presence greatly known at the night, what we would call the nighttime. Now keep in mind, in the Hebrew time frame, the day does not begin at what we call sunup. Uh -huh. The day begins at sundown. Uh -huh. And it is the evening and morning in that order of the day. There's a reason that all of this, you have to understand all of this if you're going to get into this, because it's very important. Timing is everything. So now we're dealing with angels that were created before man was created. Lucifer rebelled. Scripture says he took a third of heaven with him. Now, folks, we're not talking about 13 angels. 
by the time Lucifer rebelled, there were literally millions upon millions of angels. And Lucifer was so powerful. And by himself, he was more powerful than all the rest of them put together. Now think about that one for a minute. And one of the smallest of the angels could wipe out 185,000 of Sennacherib's troops in one night. Just a minor angel. We're not talking about an archangel. We're certainly not talking about Gabriel, who could have taken out the planet with the snap of his finger. The one we refer to as the death angel, the destroyer, Gabriel who's also the messenger of God, which is what mm -hmm. angel means, messenger. But why all of this? The angels were created, all of them, with the ability to think independently and free will. God created free-willed beings, both the spirit beings mm -hmm. and mortal man. And he respects his creation enough that he's not going to force a decision on them. He's going to warn them. He's going to say, none of you are perfect. This includes the angels. Mm -hmm. You know, we say, well, we're only mortal human beings. So stop limiting it to just yourself. Scripture says he charges his angels with folly and laughs at them. Right. His only requirement of the angels is to admit they made a mistake and say, Lord, I messed up. And God just laughs and says, I know. No problem. Keep going. It's when we try to hide the fact that we screwed up. Or that we didn't ask God for direction before we did something we've never done before. This is what leads us into trouble. Hmm. You know what could have prevented a whole lot of pain and suffering? Is if Eve had just screamed for help when the serpent started talking to her. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all thy ways, acknowledge, acknowledge him. him, and he shall direct thy past. That applies to spirit beings as well. It applied to the serpent. As I pointed out many times, read it in scripture. After man, after God dealt with man, the fall, he had a little discussion with the serpent. And he cursed the serpent for allowing Lucifer into his body. Huh. It, it, it's commonly misunderstood. And people look at it, they read it, and they go right past it. No. God judged the serpent for allowing himself to be possessed. He had the ability. Does that still happen to this day? Ed? What do we think demonic possession is? So, is God, is, so God is going to judge the animals also? If they allow themselves to be possessed. Let me give you a good example. Okay. When Jesus encountered the demoniac in the Gadarenes, they said to Jesus, art thou come? to assign us to the abyss before our times. And they were very particular in their use of terms. Not just to hell, but to the abyss. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this is important because the abyss is where their parents are. They were, they were concerned that their time was up and the judgment was at hand because the judge was standing there. Uh -huh. 
And Jesus told them, no, it's not your time. I'm not going to break the rules. And they pleaded with Jesus to be allowed to enter into the pigs, the unclean animal that Jews had no business raising. And the pigs, but observe what the pigs did. This is extremely important. The pigs would not live with the, their choice. They would not live with the unclean spirits in them, and they ran and committed suicide. They'd rather their flesh die than be possessed by demons. Okay, so you just opened up a whole new can of worms, and we're probably and not to have this conversation. Happen. We will get there. We will get there. So, I, so with the, the, I know we're running out of time um, for for today. Um, I do want to ask, however, and I guess I'll make note of it, um, is that if in the event that a, a mortal being, a human being, is dealing with demonic possession and does not want to live with it in the flesh and they commit suicide, is that a pardonable or forgivable sin or do we just not know? Yes that yet yes that's a pardonable sin god said that there's no sin you can commit except blaspheming against the holy spirit there's no sin you can commit that he can't forgive so how can you repent or ask for forgiveness upon the event of suicide you do it beforehand we'll get into that in detail later but, but okay. bear with me. That's all part of what we're going to talk about. So, Lord, forgive me. I'm about to go off on this woman because she. <laughs> no, no, no. Listen. We can ask for for the forgiveness. You, 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 you get, you're getting off topic now. I, I'm just. I'll I'm guide you to the you. correct Indian. answer. I'll guide you to the correct answer. But please follow me. Okay, we have a few we, more minutes. Every time we deviate. Okay. We, we think we're getting into the answer, but all we're doing is 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 wasting time. And we're getting off the subject. The thing I want to get across right now, before we leave for today, is these angels had an encounter with man. It is recorded in the uh, Bible, in several books. It is recorded in detail in the book of Enoch. But it is also an event that has left its mark in the physical, tangible world of Earth and our history. One of the best examples of the record of this encounter is in the discussion of Greek mythology. Greek mythology is based on angelic encounters with man. What we need to understand is who were the Olympians? Where and what was Mount Olympus? And I'm not talking about a hill in Greece. Who were the Olympians, the inhabitants of Mount Olympus? Where was it? What was it? And who were the Titans? The Olympians and the Titans actually existed. There was a reason mortal human beings worshiped them by the millions all over the planet. There's a reason you can find historical references that lead to these things all over the planet. So what we need to get an understanding of is what happened with the angels, according to the Bible, and how does this relate to the Olympians and the Titans? That's what we're going to get into next week. Okay. All right. 
All right. So um, we had a nice room today. Thank you guys for, for joining us on today as we delved into the Unseen Realm Part 2. Lots and lots and lots of deep information. So um, I, I guess what most of us, many of us need to do if we do not have the Bible with the Apocrypha um, is to get one and to go back and read, like you were mentioning, Ed, the Book of Enoch, right? Because it just seems like there are... The Book of Enoch is a separate book. So that is a separate book. You need to read the Apocrypha. Okay. But you can can get a copy of the Book of Enoch for free. You can download it from the internet. Oh, okay. Okay. So I learn something new every day. So we can download the the Book of Enoch um, for free off of the internet. So Mm -hmm. some of you that are interested, um, I encourage you guys to go and do that. Again, thank you guys for tuning in. I'm praying that you guys are leaving with a little bit more than what you came with. Um, and as you guys know, I do like to close out each and every show with a word of prayer. So, Ed, I'm going to ask, would you like to lead us in that on today? Yeah. Um, Something else you want to add? I'm just making a note here for next time. Okay. Um, yes. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we ask that you would Bless us in understanding and wisdom. Open our minds and our hearts to have a deeper understanding of you, Lord. We come for the meat of the word, not just the pablum. We ask you, Lord, to help us to understand so that we might be able to withstand the wiles of the evil one. Help us, Lord. Bless us. Grant us your grace wisdom, and strength. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So I pray again that you guys were blessed by that. Um, This Tuesday, uh, last Tuesday, I had come or this past Tuesday and the Tuesday, I want to say before that, I'd come on and I've been talking with you guys about business. Um, The first show I did was helping you guys construct the the business plan. The second, which was this past um, Tuesday, I talked to you guys um, about the, the different business structures, um, and also, um, some extra ways that you guys can make money. So this upcoming Tuesday, um, prayerfully, um, we're going to be talking about establishing your business credit and trade lines. So hopefully you guys can join us on Tuesday. Um, I'm thinking about changing the time as we're, you know, um, getting busy and it's just, it's just so late for me to come on that late, especially with my, my Eastern folks. So, um, you guys stay tuned for that. Again, thank you, Dr. Ed, for today um, with the Unseen Realm. Uh, we've got a few people chiming in. Uh, Leela, thank you for tuning in on Facebook. She says, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Um, yeah, because this is a lot. This is a lot to digest, folks. So make sure you guys come back and join us again next Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific Time, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Time as we continue with our discussion, the unseen realm. So you guys have a fantastic weekend ahead and we'll see you guys then. Bye.